Hello, my name is Jeff Morton, a Colonel in the United States Army, 40 years of service. This is called Day 142 of 365. It was a Sunday in Afghanistan. It is more about the feelings and taking you with me on a mission similar to what we did each day, each night, for we are night hunters, in Afghanistan when I served there in 2005, 6, and 7. I hope it conveys to you that what we soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines experience is confusing, difficult to digest, and let me be clear about this, the memories never leave us. Never ever. We just learn, hopefully, to live with them. And so I'll begin. Cold encourages a rapid change into uniform. Kick open your sack. Moving, moving. Oh, those boots are cold. Fresh snow blankets the ground, and footprints tell me I'm ahead of the crowd. A clear sky allows any warmth to escape. Sounds are crisp and carries. I cherish my three minutes of warm water that may be my last shower, then scrape my face. Operations is always open, and the units report in as we withdraw through the shadows. No wake-up calls, no contact, a quiet night. The patrols slide in from overwatch and save our breakfast, loud, excited, relieved. Beside them, patrols finish breakfast and slide out to clear the roads, quiet, somber, alert. The rhythm, like a clock, counts down the seconds to minutes until our next event. There is always a next event. Each day, we discuss the results and adjust our plans to the mishaps of a year at war. Burn the road with an electronic pulse. Thank you, Navy. We hope the cell phones are dead. Pressure plates are cleared by hand. Robots are crap. We, the sights are clear. A commander wants to lay a trap. It was his soldiers that bled on that strip of dirt. No. No. This is my area of expertise. My troops. My job. There's a sliver of moon tonight. Good hunting in the near dark. Like the scope on my rifle, we dial in our observers who lay in the snow to catch the placement. Perhaps that father and son drifting in from the pasture. The taller man's hand guides the smaller safely onto the road. I miss my family. Switching to scope, I press into the eye cup. The area is lit with infrared markers. To us, there is no darkness. We see all. And once seen, it cannot be forgotten. Father calls to son, who lowers a satchel into the culvert. How many soldiers will they kill? My radio squelches in my headphones. Permission to fire. The boy looks up and stares right at my marksman. He could be my son. Permission to fire. Hi, my name is Val Lovelace. I live in Westport Island. 
I'm a Navy veteran of 20 years, and I served from 1976 to 1996. The poem I'm reading today is called The Women I Know, and it was inspired by the women who've touched my life in various ways and inspired me from, from birth until now. So, the women I know. The women I know are easy in their skin. They show signs of wear, of course, having been beaten with the force of living. Grayed wisps of hair fall over wrinkled faces, while clear but tired eyes hold visions of the future, and sometimes tear with visiting memories. Bones may bend where they did not before, after ages of working, or weeds in the garden, or children propped on hips with the groceries, and the day's mail, and the car keys, and the half-consumed, now-cold cup of coffee, and the worn stuffed toy missing an eye, magically capable of soothing a wailing child. The women I know raise their voices to each day, no matter the weather or trend or popularity or political correctness of things assumed to have grave importance. Wisdom wraps their words in fire and ice and clarity and a kind of knowing one only acquires through decades of being woman. Thinking and feeling and speaking in earthy tones, they are sisters of blood and sisters of choice, kindred through experiences which threaten to make them not enough or too loud or ugly. But they would not have it, though years might have passed before freedom finally found them. The women I know examine the world through lenses colored by compassion raw honesty, and the kindest of mercies. They are builders and creators and warriors, raising families and empires for the future. In the grist and grind of difficult living, they may falter or fall, yet always rise again, and again and again and yet again, until generations have left their mark. They forge their way with beats of justice, because they already know what is possible the way a river knows to etch its way through the land, changing its course. The women I know are rightly fierce, strong of will and wild dreamers who harnessed howling winds on dark nights, who stoked themselves with raving courage, impatient with nonsense, unafraid of truth, quick-witted, kind-hearted, tender when that matters. They are a brimming glass, a broad palate, Spare of word and generous of laughter, dancing to ancient music in their bones. Do not fancy it easy to cross them. When patience grows weary, they rise renewed and under full sail turn into the storm because they suffer neither fools nor folly. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matthew Eichenlaub. I, um, I am a veteran. I was in the Air Force uh, 1965 to 1969. Um, right now I um, act as a volunteer, a facilitator at um, the VA in Tugas for creative writing. Um, this poem um, is about my parents and trains. I grew up in Latonia, Kentucky. Trains were a big influence on in my life. Um, and the title of the poem is 1951. 33 years separated my mom and dad. She 22, he 55 when they got married. Her brothers didn't like it much and yet they liked my dad. He worked as a railway express messenger, sorted mail rolling through the night, Cincinnati to Atlanta run, then a day or two at a rooming house. Just before leaving Atlanta, he'd call home. At the appointed hour, we'd head out, drive to town, and wait by a railroad crossing. From afar, the rumble and nearby flashing lights and the ding-ding of wooden crossing guards coming down. 
Mom lifting me to see the railway express car, its broad milky windows pulled down, dad waving, swooshing by. Then back in the car, a fast drive to the suspension bridge, over the Ohio River, down into Cincinnati, and on out to Union Terminal. <clears throat> there, amidst the comings and goings, we'd find him. The old photographs show Mom as brunette with curly perm and humble smile. Dad is thin in his double-breasted suit, complete with fedora and cigarette. In the telling of these old stories, Mom was somewhat defensive. He never acted old, she would say, always young. But this last story is mine alone. When he got sick and could no longer work, Dad and I would drive down to King Drugs to pick up Mom at the end of her shift. We'd wait for her in the old Plymouth with its beige steering wheel and gleaming Baroque dashboard. Heater on, I'd drift down into the soft brown felt. Outside, gray parking lines lay hidden beneath freezing puddles of blue and red neon. Suddenly, the door would swing open, cold air and mom rushing in, ice crystals sparkling all across the top of her hair, mama bear pulling me in, cold rouged cheeks squishing against mine, giving, giving, she was always giving giving everything she had. <clears throat>